Well, I'd like to welcome everyone. I am recording. And so if you do not want to be recorded, act accordingly. But we are going to go ahead and get started today. My name is Chris Reese, a technologist at Award Solutions. And I host the AI and Telecom Meetup. And so the topic for this, this month is a topic that I find very interesting on AI and the radio access network. And we're going to focus a little bit more on 5G specifically. And I'm going to talk a little bit about 4G and 5G. So at any point, if you have any questions, please let me know. The goal is for not for the goal is not for us to focus so much on what is 5G, but the goal is to talk about the impact of 5G, um, or more importantly, the impact of AI on 5G. Where can there be some, some synergy between the two? Mm -hmm. And I've got a number of, of, of slides I want to present, but at any point, please feel free to ask questions. Before we get into that, a couple of announcements. Um, our next AI and telecom meetup, which will be on May 17th, I'm still working on um, topic and speaker. It will be a guest speaker that, that month. Um, I will be out, but trying to work through some of those details. As always, if you have ideas for presenting as well as desire to present yourself, please let me know. You can reach me via the AI and Telecom Meetup. You can reach me via LinkedIn, or you can reach me via my email address, which I'm gonna put into the chat right now. C-R-E-E-C-E -E -E at awardsolutions.com. And Award Solutions is the sponsor of the meetup. Another interesting um, event that is coming up on Saturday, if anyone would like to get a little bit more involved, get their hands dirty, is the Global AI Community and I'm on a, I'm not a very active member of this, of this, this team, but thankfully our fearless leader, Ron Dagdag is on the, the call. Um, we are having a, a, an event on Saturday that's going to talk about AI and IoT. And um, basically, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ron, it's, it's how you get all that data that's being processed within an IoT device into some type of a cloud environment to actually do whatever analysis that you need. Yeah, it's more uh, related to processing uh, AI or IoT devices, processing edge devices, right? Okay. AI and edge, AI and the edge devices. That's that's the uh, AI and saying. edge devices. Excellent. And as always, we do also have a Slack channel that everyone is welcome to join. And you'll see that there's a, uh, a link there. Okay. Um, cool. So what I wanna talk about today is um, AI and radio access network. So I wanna talk first about really what is a radio access network? And I'm gonna focus on um, a little bit of 4G, but more on 5G. And so if you're not familiar with the radio access network at all, um, that's okay. I, I kind of want to just talk about some of the key elements of it. I want to then go and say, so, so what? Why is this so complicated? Why is everybody interested in things like AI and 5G? And so I want to talk a little bit about kind of why it's so complicated, why this is a, a desired thing. And then lastly, I want to talk about some specific AI use cases. And this is still very, very new. You'll see um, many examples where a company has, has implemented something, but I wouldn't say that it's mainstream and I wouldn't say that it's, it's common across the board. I think it's still in that, that, that early day of using machine learning within some of the algorithms that we're going to talk about today. So let's start with an overview of the radio access network. So if I think about 5G specifically, what are some of the goals of 5G? Now, if you're not familiar with 5G, 5G is the fifth generation of wireless. It is the version of wireless that is currently being deployed as we speak. You've probably seen um, commercials for 
um, Verizon and AT&T and T-Mobile about their 5G network. Uh, if you go back to late last year, um, you had all these commercials that would run during football for Verizon and, and uh, they, they were along the lines of, if Verizon's 5G is good enough for the NFL, it's good enough for you. And really what they're getting at is just some of the stuff that we're going to talk about here. 5G is unique compared to the previous generations of technology, not because it's just the latest and greatest version. It's because it was designed with kind of a different mentality. So if you kind of go through the, the progression of the Gs, right, 1G is really about voice, and it was analog, right, simple. 2G was really about digital voice, and this is where GSM, CDMA, TDMA were the, the technologies that were being used. 3G is really about voice and data. And this is where we had things like UMTS and 1X EVDO. But we had voice and data as separate initiatives. 4G, which is LTE, is really about data. So you can kind of think of the problem that we were trying to solve in 4G similar to the problems that we're trying to solve with Wi-Fi. How can I have a wireless data connection? And so it really is focused more on that, that data as the ultimate service. How do I get connected to the internet? And so all of us working from home using, you know, because of, of, of COVID, we're very familiar with this. And I can use my Wi-Fi connection to, to watch Netflix. I can use it to, to VPN into my corporate network. I can use it to, you know, stream Zoom. But it really is about data. We focus on 5G and one of the differences is 5G is geared more around services. It's not exactly true from a design of the standard perspective, but from an implementation perspective, 4G was really some degree of best effort. Not exactly true. There's some, some slide examples here or there. But really, it was designed to be much more around, hey, here's a data pipe, good luck. 5G is much more around services. And 5G is just referred to as 5G. It doesn't have another name, per se. Now, the services is very important. Since it's got services in mind, what we this provides the opportunity is for a lot of variation. LTE on its own, there wasn't a lot of variations to it. The way that one operator deployed LTE, the way that one service used LTE really wasn't that different from the way another operator or another service provider used LTE. 5G is quite a bit different. And so depending on what you're trying to do may greatly differ the way your 5G network looks. And we'll get into some of those as we get into some of the slides, but I wanted to at least set that context. That being said, some of the desires of 5G. Well, one, we do want to get to a higher throughput. Higher throughput is always going to be a demand. More is always going to be needed. I remember I was talking to somebody um, last week, uh, um, a group of people that um, I meet with on a regular basis. They're significantly younger than I am. And we were talking about data speeds. And I remember, and some of you probably remember, um, a 1200 baud modem, a 300 baud modem. And I remember when I was in grad school, this has been 1990, 
And I had gotten a 1200 baud modem to connect into the mainframe at the university. And I, someone let me borrow their 9,600 baud modem going from, you know, 1200 baud to 9,600 baud. I thought it was just amazing. I didn't realize that things could get any better than that. I thought my life was complete at that point. Um, 9,600 baud, 9.6 kilobits per second. I mean, that's just nothing compared to what we can get to today. And so every generation is trying to do faster and faster throughputs. We start thinking about things from a service perspective. We might want to have things like lower latency, higher network reliability. We also may have other types of services that want to have things like a large number of connection density, a longer battery life, as well as lower latency. And so you can kind of see for each of these kind of groups of applications, be it security cameras or some type of, of home system, some type of gaming system, autonomous driving, IoT devices, smart factory, manufacturing, they all have different types of requirements. And so you can see that that should have a pretty significant impact on our 5G network. Some of the performance targets of 5G, just to kind of set the stage. Peak data rates of 20 gigabits per second in the downlink, 10 gigabits per second in the uplink. Now that's a lot. That's a, that's a, a pretty impressive um, throughput. It's not fiber to my house, good, but it's still pretty good. It is, it is amazingly good. And so we're wanting to get those throughput levels up. Now, the, the second one, which I think is one of the more interesting um, targets is I'd like to have a latency within the radio access network of less than a millisecond. And that is really critical. So as we start to look at certain services that sub millisecond delay becomes very, very important. The examples you're always going to hear are autonomous driving and uh, remote surgery. Remote surgery to me doesn't seem real likely in the short term. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'm really interested to be um, one of the test subjects of the remote surgery experiment. And autonomous driving is another area where having the network make decisions that really impact how the car performs is probably not going to be sufficient, probably needs to be in the car itself. But this is one of those, those areas in which people are very much interested. One of the big, the big use cases that people are looking at in the short term here is augmented reality and virtual reality. Now, they don't need a sub millisecond delay, but they do need a round trip delay to be less than 20 milliseconds. And in some scenarios, even less than 10. So you start to see, oh, that delay is gonna become really, really important. Another interesting use case, another interesting performance target is the number of devices. With a goal of having millions of devices per square kilometer. Now, this is really important because not so much because of the, the volume of the devices. Devices I don't care about so much for our discussion today. But think about this from the amount of data that that will produce. Think about this from the perspective of the amount of information that could be available about all of those devices, the management of those devices. And so as we start to kind of tie this to AI, one of the key use cases that AI is able to support is the ability to handle a very large amount of data. Not so much um, just basic number, you know, basic amount of data. It can handle very large amounts of data. I always go back to the example that always comes to my mind when Bruno and I were at Nortel together, we would create these spreadsheets based off of the data that we were pulling from switching equipment to look at capacity. 
And at those at that time, we were probably looking at, I don't know, 8, 10, 15 columns worth of data. Well, imagine if it wasn't 8 or 10 or 15, but if it was hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of columns of data that I had to somehow process to make some type of a decision. That's really what we're getting at. Number of devices. Cell throughput, 10 megabits per second per square meter, trying to make sure that we have a, a, a density that we can support, and then still be able to support at the edge of the cell, 100 megabits per second in the downlink, 50 megabits per second in the uplink. Some of the performance targets. The ones that are, I think are the most interesting from um, what we want to talk about are really these two up here and a little bit of this one, a little bit of that. Um, okay, so when we talk about the radio network, and this is an, an okay slide to discuss this, and I'm gonna focus on the right-hand side for, for a second. This is really a very high level 5G network. And it's going to start with the radio access network out here. And the radio access network is going to be composed of base stations. Now, you'll notice my base stations kind of have a couple of different forms. One, it looks a little bit more like a, um, a Wi-Fi antenna. So it's really trying to represent a small cell. Maybe it's a cell that I'm putting in a, a corporate environment or in a campus. And you'll also notice this looks a little bit more like a telephone pole. So another example is putting things at like the top of light poles, putting them in the top of, of electrical poles and such. So the nature of the cell site may change. Another thing that we're going to see as part of this is we're going to start to see a higher volume. We'll see more and more cell sites. I'll get into that a little bit more here in a minute we kind of start to move up the network and we have something called edge computing. And we've talked a bit about edge computing. As a matter of fact, we had a meetup that we discussed um, edge computing a few months ago, where what type of services might we put in a server that's located fairly close to the cell sites? And that's what's typically referred to as an edge site. There's a standard called a multi-axis edge computing or MEC. We have the 5G core itself, which is really managing kind of the system in general. And then I might connect to some third-party apps, some data network, or maybe IMS. But what 3GPP is really defining, and 3GP is the standards organization, is really all of this. MEC itself is defined by a different group, but that's okay. It's still a standard, still a standard. Now, what I want us to zoom in on, the, the, the things that I care about are really these two things here. So we're gonna kind of dive into that in a little bit more detail over the next few slides. Kind of what's happening at the cell site and what's happening within this edge computing system. Um, okay, so if we kind of think about this piece here, pretty much everything but the 5G core. Let's look at some of the building blocks that we have. So there's a couple of things that are happening over the air interface. It needs to be able to support a large bandwidth. It needs to be able to support things like beam forming and MIMO. MIMO stands for multiple input, multiple output. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. It needs to be able to support low, mid, and high bands. 
and a flexible frame structure. Now, really what's happening on all four of these things that I've already kind of highlighted. This is the air interface enhancements to be able to support higher throughput. So the first fundamental thing about 5G over previous generations is it is more complex on the air interface. There's more stuff that the base station and the handset have to do to utilize that 5G network. And part of the reason for that is because what we're trying to do is sacrifice computational complexity for more efficiency over the air. So the more complicated we make things, the better we're able to push things over the air and, and increase our throughput. And so we're assuming that the device can handle that level of complexity. Now, one of the things that hasn't changed is physics. Physics is not different now than it was 20 years ago, 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago. Physics hasn't changed. But what we're able to do with this complexity that I'm alluding to is we're able to overcome some of the challenges of physics more through this complexity. We understand what's going on better. We're building better chips. The two things that I want us to, to really kind of lock on to here in a minute are going to be this beam forming and this bandwidth. Moving into the network a little bit. One of the other things that's becoming very, very common, and I don't have any slides on this per se, I wish I would have added it, but I didn't think about it until too late, is there's something called ORAN, which stands for the Open Radio Access Network Architecture. And what ORAN is trying to do is it's trying to define protocols so that we can split this base station up into smaller pieces. This is an example of that split. Now, as soon as we do that, as soon as we split this into these subcomponents, we get a new level of complexity. And so that's what this split architecture is focusing on. How do we manage that? How do we decide where to deploy something? Now, where this will be located, this may be located as I'm kind of drawn here, kind of with the, the base station itself, or it might be deployed in more of an edge computing site. Now, we're typically going to virtualize this, this subcomponent of the radio access network. And as soon as we virtualize it, that adds another layer of complexity that we can get into a little bit later if we want to. Okay. So there's two key areas that I want you to start to see kind of that complexity, that air interface itself, and then how we're deploying some of these subcomponents of the 5G network. Another good example of a, this is actually a core network function that will probably be pushed into the radio network is something called the universal, or the, I'm sorry, the user plane function, UPF. So where do I deploy that? How much bandwidth does it support? What does it need? What are its requirements? It could be located within this edge computing area as well. Okay, so that's a little bit about the radio access network. Let me pause for a second. Questions, comments, thoughts? All right, excellent. No, all, all good, Chris. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Bruno. Okay, so why is this so complicated? I've kind of alluded to some of that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But let me kind of go into a little bit more detail on, on some of the complexity. So this is a picture that you'll see quite often. And this kind of starts to lead to what is the problem you're trying to solve at any given point in time? Not every 5G network is the same. And so you can see there's three basic kind of feature sets. There's something called ultra-reliable, low-latency communication, 
enhanced mobile broadband, and massive machi machine type communication. So if we talk about the top one, this is really focusing on data rates. This is really kind of what we think about a lot of times when we think about a 5G network. I've got my new smartphone. My smartphone has a 5G chip. What type of data rates? What am I going to be able to do with my smartphone? And that is a great use case. And that's a common use case. As I move around the network, how is my throughput going to change? What types of services can I support? So that's the first kind of level. We move over to the left-hand side, and what we're seeing is this massive machine-type communication. This is where I want you to think about IoT-type devices. Internet of Things, if you're not familiar with that term, IoT. So for IoT devices, what we're dealing with are anything from a, a smart watch, a drone, a smart factory, um, we have examples of people putting sensors in um, agricultural areas and gathering all of this data, interacting with that device, making changes to that device, taking actions based off of that device. But really the key thing is, it's not just that I'm interacting with a device, it's the volume of devices. I'm not talking about having a, um, a sensor in a room that's telling me what the temperature is. I'm talking about having a sensor attached to every pallet in my factory so I know exactly where every pallet is. I want a sensor attached to every um, medical device that's in a hospital. So not only do I know where it is at any given point in time, I know whether it's being used or not. So that when I have an emergency and I need to get a device, I know exactly where it is and I know that it's available. This is the kind of thing that we're talking about. How many sensors are there with respect to, to um, maybe it's cameras, maybe it's, it's motion sensors within a, um, a high security building. That's really what we're talking about when we talk about this massive machine type communication. And so if you think about the nature of those things, Data rates may or may not be an issue, depending on what you're trying to do. Some solutions may have high data rates. A lot of solutions will have very low data rates. But really, it's the volume that's important. This is where we're getting into those millions of devices per square kilometer. We move over to the right-hand side, and we have this ultra-reliable, low-latency communication. This is where we're focusing on that low latency aspect. And when we talk about high reliability, what we really mean is very few lost packets. Self-driving cars are always going to be kind of an example that shows up here. We've already talked a little bit about that. I like the AR VR example a little bit better. Smart homes kind of pull, falls into this category over here. So if we compare 4G and 5G, there's two things about 5G that ends up being very important. One is that, that flexibility that we've already started to talk a lot about. We have more flexibility in what we're trying to solve and as well as we're trying to be more efficient. Now, let me define what I mean by efficient for a second. What I mean by efficiency is how well am I using the bandwidth? And let me give you kind of a simple example. I don't know if, if, uh, if you guys remember a number of years ago here, at least in the Dallas area, if you're based out of Dallas like, like I am, we went through a transition. It's probably been about 10 or 15 years now where we went from having uh, just analog broadcast television to digital broadcast television. And part of the reason for that transition from analog to digital broadcast television was so that we could take some of the frequencies back and use them as part of an auction for wireless services. What I'm really focusing on is how did that happen? How did we get that benefit by going from analog to digital? Simple. The digital, the amount of digital information is smaller. 
So the amount of bandwidth that's allocated to channel four is not the same as it was before because it's a smaller amount of bandwidth because it's now digital. That's what I mean by that efficiency. We're more efficient. We can put more things, more throughput in the same amount of spectrum. And that's really what we're looking at with 5G. How do I have the same amount of spectrum, the same amount of, of, of frequency, and have a higher amount of throughput? That's really what this efficiency is getting at. And another term you'll hear is something called spectral efficiency. And that leads us to, to something else that becomes very important. One of the things, if you're in the telecom space or even kind of loosely associated with the telecom space, one of the things that you'll notice is there seems to always be these auctions. We do auctions all the time. Well, to some degree, the government owns all of the, the, the frequencies. It's been that way since our first early days of radio 100 years ago. And back in the early 1900s, when, when broadcast radio was starting to become a thing, the government would give out these licenses. And that's when you had these early AM radio stations. Um, and then that, that kind of transitioned over the course of the 60s to, to be more FM radio station driven, which by the time you hit the 70s, FM radio stations were the, the dominant for a lot of reasons that we could get into if anybody cares. But my point is what those are, those are very specific frequency bands. The government auctions those out. Now, AM and FM is a very interesting um, phenomenon. I want to talk about that just for a second. If you've ever tried to listen to an AM radio station, one of the things you'll notice is it you're able to hear an AM radio station much farther away than you normally would, or that you, that you can an FM radio station, I should say. And the reason that I bring that up is because it's at a different frequency. So the AM radio stations can travel farther because of the frequency that they are, they're using than an FM. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than that. FM also has some other power issues um, within the United States. One of my favorite, um, I love broadcast radio history. I was a DJ for a number of years. And uh, one of my favorite things to read about is back in the 60s, the 1960s was something called border blasters. And what border blasters were, were radio stations that were on um, at the Mexico-US border on the Mexico side, pointing towards the US, very, very high power AM stations. And if you're familiar with the, the disc jockey Wolfman Jack, he was really the one that kind of made these border blasters um, famous. He had a, a radio station in Tijuana, right? South of LA, south of San Diego. And that radio station was able to be heard in the Northeast. That's how far this could go. And again, it was a very, very high powerful station. But now why do I bring all that stuff up other than I like talking about Wolfman Jack? There's a new set of spectrum that's much higher called millimeter wave. So I want you to think about this analogy of going from AM to FM, the distance that the signal can travel has dropped. Now, as I go from that to a much higher frequency, the distance will drop again and again. That's going to become important here in a second. So how are we increasing this capacity? We're uh, having more spectrum, wider bands, trying to increase our bits per second per hertz per stream, and we're trying to reuse the spectrum more. Now, this reuse adds to that complexity that I was talking about. So if you've ever been uh, in an area where you had two AM radio stations that were kind of on top of each other, you're picking up basically two different transmissions, they kind of mix and cause an interference that you can't really um, make out. You can't really separate them that's what we're talking about from an interference. The difference is, is the technology that we're using can separate those signals out and can do something with them 
for the most part. When I was in, uh, uh, was a DJ back in the, the 80s, there was a radio station that was in Mexico that was at the same frequency as an AM radio station that we had. And so at certain times of the day, we actually could hear kind of a mix of the radio station we were broadcasting and this radio station out of Mexico because of this phenomenon that I'm talking about. And this is just a chart talking about millimeter wave. Now, what I want you to think about is the higher we go on this chart, the shorter the distances will become. Now, the reason I'm focusing on the shorter distance is think about this from, I mean, again, I, and, and, and just don't raise your hand, don't worry about anything like that, but how many times have you been in your house trying to do something with your cell phone? And maybe not so much now that we have smartphones connected to Wi-Fi, but back in the day when you were trying to make and receive a phone call back in the, um, with, a, with a flip phone, and you're like, oh, I never can make a phone call. I never get phone calls if I'm in my bedroom. My bedroom has just got such bad coverage. That's what we're talking about. This good coverage that you're, you're talking about is the fact that you have a high enough signal coming into the area that you're trying to, to get to. The higher the frequency, the lower that propagation. Okay, so... All of that said, and then let's talk a little bit about AI use cases. And there's a great article that I found. It was from uh, OMDIA. It's a report that they had put out. Um, Here is actually the report itself. I've included the, the link at the bottom. AI use cases in RAM. And they had a couple of charts that I wanted to just kind of steal to see if that would help us kind of understand some of the key use cases. And so let me kind of go through this and then I want to kind of open things up for questions. So why is AI relevant to the RAM based off of everything that we've talked about so far? One. we're able to analyze a very large amount of data very quickly. And so we've talked about millions of devices per square kilometer. We've talked about a very large number of cell sites because of bandwidth. Oh, what was the quote? I was talking to a friend of mine about this last week. And he said, the number of cell sites, if you're using this millimeter uh, bandwidth, this millimeter wave frequencies, you're probably going to have five, to 10 times as many cell sites. So think about that for a second. Five to 10 times as many cell sites. No one person can handle 10 times the work. We need something to help them manage those cell sites. And these are gonna produce a very large amount of data, very large amount of data. And not only is it gonna produce a large amount of data, we need to process that data in real time. We need to be able to make some real time decisions. We want to be able to use historical data to be able to predict some type of future event. And so we talk a little bit about in AI as we're trying to, 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 to do predictions. Is it a descriptive analysis, trying to understand what happened? Or is it a, um, a predictive analysis, predicting what we think is going to happen, or a prescriptive analysis, a recommendation of a change to prevent a problem from occurring. So we want to be able to use these insights. And this term insight is important. Whenever you see this term insight, what that really means, it's really more of a technical term these days, that means some type of an actionable piece of information. I was watching a, a, a webinar not too long ago and they, they had a great point. Information is just data. And I may have a ton of information. Insight is actionable. 
That's the action that I want to take. I want to be able to do you know, correlate trends from multiple data sets. Maybe I'm getting data from elements within my edge computing system. I'm getting data from the devices, the IoT devices themselves. I'm getting data from the cell sites. I'm getting data from the servers. I'm getting data from the virtualization layer. And I want to take all those things together and see if I can do some type of root cause analysis of a failure. Or start to learn how to maybe move functions around, maybe use it for planning purposes, and then provide recommendations for assisted or unassisted operations. And I, I really like this phrase, assisted and unassisted. Assisted, we've got a human being involved, but that human being are, are using these tools to help make decisions. Unassisted, we have the system making decisions on their own. And I think both of those add a lot of value. As we start to think about AI use cases themselves, there's four main areas at least that, that this report talks about and other things I've read kind of um, defines things in similar ways. That's why I liked this picture. We have RAN design and planning, deployment, optimization, and network operations. Now you'll notice in all of these, the AI that we're talking about here is AI a service provider would use to make their life better. I'm not talking about a service provided to a customer. I'm not talking about a service that's providing a value add to the customer necessarily. What we're really focusing on here is how to make the network better. So within the, the RAN design and planning, looking at traffic analysis and doing planning of where to locate functions. In deployment, automatic detection and configuration of base stations verifying site performance. There's a function that's been around, the, the, the concept has been around for, for probably 10 years now called SON, Self-Optimizing Networks, S-O-N. And we actually talked about this in, in one of our meetups a while back. What SON is about is all of the base stations talking to each other to make decisions of how they should operate. AI, is going to be built into those SON algorithms to help make those decisions. I guess that's probably a little bit more in this optimization category. So within the RAN optimization space, capacity management, radio resource management. Radio resource management is huge. How do I optimize my radio? so that I'm able to have all of the data go through it that I want. I want no waste, no inefficiency. And that leads us to something called MIMO. Now, MIMO is a, an advanced antenna technique that's allowing us to send multiple streams of data in parallel to a subscriber to increase that data throughput. And it's just using a lot of really hard, complicated math. We started doing MIMO in 4G, even a little bit in 3G, a little bit. We started doing it in 4G, and we're now getting into it in a much more, a much bigger way. As a matter of fact, you'll start to see this term, massive, massive MIMO. Now, makes the base stations much more complicated, makes them much more expensive. And then network operations, we see traffic management, uh, content aware service experience optimization. So we know what the content is and we're going to place functions in the right place so that we're able to maximize that. How does all that happen? Power saving of the RAN. Most of the, exp the operating expense of an operator is the power to run this stuff. So if you can start to turn things off when it's not being used, it can be a really big money savings. 
And then we also have real-time network performance monitoring, a lot of the other stuff we've talked about, alarm, fault detection, RAN security, content, again, content aware, optimization and such. So kind of to tie that up is at the bottom of this, this slide. RAN, AI, the use cases span all of the stages of the RAN lifecycle. We want to be able to do uh, faster computation, data processing to reduce the amount of data that's, that's being captured. We want to build this into the RAN equipment, do real-time network performance monitoring. AI, it's like I said, it's still in its infancy in this area. And you will see examples where people are, have solved a problem using machine learning. But as we go along, since our problems are becoming so much more complex, we're gonna see more and more of this built in. Let me pause, questions, comments, thoughts at this point. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Hey. Quick question. Um, so who's working on this, like integrating SON with the optimization usual techniques? Uh, I, I, I know for a fact that the vendors, OEMs, they might be working on it, but who's actively pursuing it when it comes to, let's say, open source? I haven't seen a lot of open source in this area. Um, okay. There are a few open source initiatives. Um, probably the biggest one, if you look at the, the Deep Learning Foundation within the Linux Foundation, they have a number of um, AI projects, but they're not really geared at solving problems, more at facilitating solutions being made, if you get what I mean. And so it's more about, oh, you have a solution. This is how you can share it with other people. I have talked to people at operators who say they, they are building some of these, th these things into their systems as well. But most of the time, what I'm hearing about is either a, a you know, a Nokia and Ericsson type of a, a building of this into their platform or a service provider. Uh, the, the only example that I know of um, that I've heard kind of in a public forum has been, uh, I was at Mobile World Congress a few years ago and Nokia talked about how they built this into their base station to auto adjust bandwidth based off of streaming needs. So it'd be kind of this, um, content aware service experience optimization, at least a baby version of that. Right, but how's that AI then? Uh, that, that's usual feature, it's a feature. How's that AI, like how's that machine learning? Great, great question. It's a great question. And so, so really you can say that about any feature in general. What makes it machine learning, what makes it AI is what they had done, at least this is what the way they, they, they explained it to me, is if you kind of draw it this way, where this is, I'll call this the feature. So you're absolutely right. I've got some data that's being pulled into this algorithm, right? And so it's gonna be base station related counters, for example. I have whatever my normal software logic is. But at this point, we're starting to see some type of a call to some type of a trained AI model. This is gonna be some type of an API call or some type of a procedure call. And then we're going to base off of that, we're going to have some type of software, I'll call it action logic of what needs to change in the system. Now, you're absolutely right. From the outside world, if I'm just looking outside of the box, is there really any difference between um, just a software feature and an AI-based software feature? No, there's not. What we're really saying is, is that we're starting to see this piece, instead of it being just some type of if-then logic created by an engineer, is actually a trained AI model based off of a lot of relevant data. This would be what we, we've talked about in the past of um, the deployed model. And so in the case of Nokia, what they did is they took a very large amount of data of how the network was behaving 
with streaming under a number of different conditions. And they trained a model to be able to make predictions. And then that's what they built into their algorithm. That's what makes it an AI model. Does that make right. sense? Gotcha. Yes, okay. it does. Yeah. yeah, it's a great question. It's a really, really important question. Um, and I think you could say we're, we're using this base station feature as an example here, but there's really no different between this and an AI-based um, medical piece of medical equipment or an AI-based, you know, whatever, right? Really, at the end of the day, when we use that term AI, what it's saying is we have this red circle is somehow involved. And the way this was, was created was through training based off of a set of data versus a bunch of if-then statements created by an engineer. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I have to drop on a call. So the one last question that I sure. have before I jump on, and I'm, I know I'm taking too much time, but um, so let's say, you know, a Nokia built this and, you know, me being Samsung, you know, I, I, I do the same, right? So what I'm saying is that uh, let's say that uh, if an engineer designed a query and uh, Nokia made it into a feature, would this AI module that either Samsung or Nokia will be building or Ericsson will be building in the future, would it be able to code or write a code of a specific condition in itself or does it always need assistance? So it'll need some data. Mm -hmm. It'll need some set of data. I'm not sure I completely understand your question, but but each of these these algorithms will need to have it'll have some type of data and it'll be able to make some type of a, of a, a prediction. Now it'll probably be proprietary, and so it'll only look at the data that's available to it within that that closed system, unless we're dealing with like an open source thing that's pulling data from various things. Um, I don't think I'm doing a very good job of answering your question though. No worries, no worries. I'll I'll leave you a text as well. I got perfect. Go. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Right. Yeah. So Ashley's asked a really good question in the chat that I am not going to be able to give you a really good answer. Um, what is 6G and 7G going to look like? Um, I think 5G is the last G I'm going to work on. I'm, I plan on retiring before 6G happens. Um, but I'm, I've not looked, I know they've started having some conversations and, um, and, and Mark Harms, please feel free to jump on if you've got some, some, some useful information here. But um, my understanding so far of 6G, it's very early, but it's really gonna be a variation of, of a theme. It's going to be um, higher throughputs, higher amounts of bandwidth, higher frequencies, higher amounts of MIMO. It's really gonna be continuing down the same path. I don't know of anything that's that's more than that, Mark. That's my understanding as well, Chris. Okay. I have heard them, you know, the higher bandwidth, higher throughput. Where do you get that? That might be in terahertz frequency ranges. That's about the only detail I've heard of. And and, and every year, you know, every generation, we see more and more um, uh, enhancement of um, some of these beam steering techniques, right? So if you kind of envision, utopia would be. I've got this phone and there is a kind of a, a ball that's able to, to, to surround this phone of, of the frequency that's mine. Now you go over here, you know, six inches and it has zero in, interference. So I could have another device that's getting all of the, the available frequencies here. That's really your, your utopia. What we're starting to see with 5G is we're starting to get better and better at trying to really point the beams, point the energy directly at the device and cause less interference. The more we do that, the higher the bandwidths are gonna be. Now, let's be honest. Does this device really need 20 gigabits per second? Probably not. Does it need 100 gigabits per second? Does it need, you know, you know, 500 gigabits per second? Probably not. But if I could have every device, if I could have millions of devices in one square kilometer that were all getting 20 gigabits per second, that would be something fantastic. It's that kind of, of at least the ideals moving forward. Um, 7G, I think is gonna be telepathy. I don't know. It'll just be hats. We all wear the hats and we just think. 
Praise one. I I do have a question about please um, security. In the in the in your last slide, uh, one of the items was um, sec security. Um, yeah, run security using AI. Um, do you know a little bit about, about how uh, that is being done? I mean, from what I see that you know, with the increase, the dramatic increase in the number of of endpoints that connect to the network. Um, with that increases the number of vulnerabilities that we have for bad parties to, you know, uh, get in and do stuff, bad stuff in the network. Right, so right, right. how how is AI uh, being used to to increase or enhance the security? So I, I don't know exactly what they're getting at with, with that particular point. What I've read about with respect to AI and security is exactly the kind of thing that you're, you're talking about. Can I start to train a model to start to see indicators of when a problem is occurring? And then um, another thing that I really like to talk about when I talk about AI and security is anomaly detection. Because really every problem, the first time it shows up is an anomaly, right? So the first time you see someone that's trying to, to, to infiltrate a system, it doesn't look like you're trying to infiltrate the system. It looks like it's an anomaly. It's some, why do we have all these scans on port 53 type of a, of a weird thing? Uh -huh. And so trying to identify those as really anomalous so that we can then have a human being take um, action quicker. Um, okay. Bruno, do you have any thoughts on that? Or did you drop? Bruno dropped. Um, Bruno works for Palo Alto. And so Bruno may have had some yeah. thoughts on that. Okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there's a, a lot of work that's being done um, in that. And that's actually an area, if somebody is, is uh, into AI and security, I'd love to talk to you because that's one of the talks I'd love for us to do here in, in the meetup. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you. I'm gonna formally kind of close the, the meetup. I'm gonna um, stop the recording um, because I know people need to, to kind of get on to, to next meetings and such. And I do wanna make sure to thank everybody for that. Uh, quick reminder, we will meet again next month. Um, topic is TBD.